This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. Thank you for attending everybody. And Tim, you can begin your presentation. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Outstanding. So thank you for having me back. I have enjoyed my partnership with EAB University over the years. And one of the things that I found is um, if the ticks keep doing what they're doing, I will have a long and fruitful partnership with EABU going forward because we are seeing lots of new developments in the tick world in Ohio and in the Ohio Valley and surrounding states. And so I'm going to go into a bunch of information here for you. Some of it is going to be stuff that you're familiar with, and then there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that is probably new to you. So one of the reasons that we are having such a tremendous public health problem with ticks and tick vector disease is because the state of ticks has changed so rapidly. Really, it's gone in Ohio from one tick of medical importance 20 years ago to five now with two new ones in just the last couple few years. And we have not matched our knowledge gaps with the speed that which ticks are moving. And what I try to do is I try to dispel some of the myths that existed from back the way it was that are uh, now found to be uh, untrue the way it is now. And myth number one is that ticks are only active in summer. And while we do have heightened tick activity from April through September, what we know, depending on the tick species, of course, is that we have tick activity every month of the year. We have confirmed positive cases of Lyme disease every single month of the year in Ohio, including December, January, February, it doesn't matter. We might have periods of relatively low activity when there's a polar vortex out there, but when we get nice days, especially with some good humidity, like today, mid 50s go into 60s, uh, today in Ohio, in central Ohio where I'm at, uh, we're gonna have tick activity out there. They're gonna emerge, they're gonna quest, they're gonna look for a host, and they're gonna look to uh, get a meal so that they can continue on their way. Myth number two is that ticks prefer the woods, and while that is true for a couple of ticks, such as, say, the, the um, deer tick, also known as the black-legged tick or the lone star tick, they are woods preferential dwellers. But when we think of some of the other ticks, like American dog tick or Gulf Coast tick, they're perfectly fine in a little bit more open habitat, such as a meadow or a grassland or a pasture. And the last couple of times I've had American dog ticks on me, it was in a lawn in the city of Columbus. They were crawling up me and I noticed uh, that they were doing that. And that was pretty much in the afternoon in mowed grass. And so you can encounter a tick not only almost every day of the year, but in pretty much any habitat that you would be in outside. And then myth number three is one that um, we're still getting more research on and research is ongoing on, on trying to figure out exactly what we need to know and what we don't know. But it is the, the myth is that it takes a full day of attachment and feeding with a tick on a host. And that's assuming that the tick has disease present in it in the first place, but that it takes a full 24 hour feeding period before that tick starts to vector disease to the host. That is CDC research from adult Lyme disease transmitting deer ticks to humans, and that is accurate in that case. But what we're finding is, is there's a lot of variables that we need to research and understand to get a fuller picture of the actual transmission times, meaning we have differences in the different tick species in terms of what they transmit because each tick species has sort of its favorite diseases. They all don't transmit every disease and those different species transmit disease at different time rates. And then we find that depending on the actual disease itself, there might be a different length of attachment time before that disease would be vectored because the diseases may live in different parts within the host. And in fact, there's actually an allergic syndrome we're going to talk about that might be uh, a fairly quick uh, transmission. And, and I don't like to use transmission with allergy, but you know what I mean. How long does it take an allergy to take effect from a bee sting or eating a peanut? 
And then another variable would be, what is the life stage of the tick? Is it a larval form, an info form, an adult form? And so all of those things are the variables in there. And what I tell folks, and I'm going to tell you folks this right now, and, and I mean this with a straight face, even though it, it may sound flippant, my goal for all of you is that you never, ever get bit by a tick ever for the rest of your life. And while it's easy to say, it might be a little bit challenging to do, but hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a, a little bit of a fuller understanding of the public health risk, as well as some of the things that you can do to keep you, yourself, and your families tick safe. All right, so the disease transmission, just to kind of go in a little bit more in depth with this one, there's different attachment times for different diseases in terms of their length of attachment for successful transmission of disease. And again, the tick has to have that disease inside them, that pathogen, that bacterial, that virus, that protozoal pathogen in order for it to vector it. But we're seeing things like anaplasmosis might actually only take 12 to 24 hours. Uh, and we've seen in the laboratory that nymphal deer ticks have transmitted Powassan virus to mice in as little as 15 minutes. It really depends where the where the pathogen lives inside the tick. It could be in its salivary glands, it could be in the gut, and that is going to influence the transmission. So we're going to talk about the uh, state of ticks in Ohio, but I would say that for surrounding states, this is pretty darn close to Indiana, and this is going to be really mirrored by, say, West Virginia and Pennsylvania. The five ticks of importance that we have would be the American dog tick, the black-legged tick, Lone Star tick, Gulf Coast tick, and Asian longhorn tick. But I want to um, take your attention and put it on the finger in front of you on the screen you can see relative sizes of ticks. On the far right, we have Lone Star male and female. And in the middle, we have the relatively large American dog tick male and female. And then as we go left on the screen, you can see we have the male and female of the deer tick and they're pretty small. But take a look all the way to the far left in that little dot there. That is a black legged or deer tick nymph. And that nymph is fully capable of vectoring disease to you. And that nymph is probably going to be nearly impossible for you to detect by feeling it or to find it when you're doing a tick check. And that makes it more likely that it would vector disease to you simply because you can't find it to get it off before it attaches and starts feeding. And so when we talk about our personal protective plan later on, while we do have a thorough tick check when you come inside as part of that protocol, we're going to add a few other things into that protocol to make sure we have a, a more whole integrated uh, pest management protocol to keep yourself safe. All right, we're going to start with the American dog tick and we're going to timeline this a little bit. So when I was in private practice, I dealt with this tick um, not uncommonly. I would say it was not rare. Uh, its disease transmission was not super common back then. We didn't really have high prevalence rate of disease in the American dog tick, say, 20 years ago. When we talk about habitats and things like that, the American dog tick is one that prefers a little bit more open habitat, like a pasture or a uh, meadow. It is known for vectoring uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Not every tick, like I said, transmits every disease, but this is the one that is going to do the vectoring for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And I want to draw your attention to the host range uh, map that we have here. And you can see that there's a line where it shows the American dog tick prevalence as the Pacific coast, but then the majority of the eastern half of the United States. You're going to see this map is very similar when we look at all the ticks that we're going to look at today for the most part. But what I want to point out is when I was at the International Tick Symposium uh, earlier last year, I got to present with a whole bunch of other researchers that were doing some really cool work in tick and tick vector disease. And one of them is a researcher who collects ticks from citizen science out west. He's in Colorado. And he had noted that he was getting tick submissions to him from areas out west where, quite honestly, this tick is not really known to, uh, to have established colonies. And if there's one thing that I do know about ticks is they definitely don't read the literature. They will move where they move. They can adapt rapidly. Global climate change is opening up new areas for them. And if they can find a spot that is pretty close to what they like and they have a food source there, it's not uncommon for them to adapt to that space. 
All right, so let's go to 2010. And in 2010, the black legged tick, also known as the deer tick, was discovered for the first time in Ohio in Coshocton County. And since that point, our map, if we look at it by 2014, has shown that it is expanded into a lot of the wooded, more Appalachian regions of Ohio. That is um, where we see the deer tick really in a hot spot. And I'm going to show you some maps here in a little bit that show you where we have very high prevalence rates of deer ticks. The deer tick right now, I would say, is public enemy number one for me, simply because of the fact that it is really brought close to people because of deer migration. We have deer now, not only in rural environments, but we have heavy populations of deer in urban environments. So we do have Lyme disease in the cities. The deer tick would be a more woods preferential tick otherwise simply because of its two primary hosts. Its small mammal host is the white-footed mouse. Its large mammal host would be the deer. But what I really don't like about the deer tick is the a huge list of devastating diseases that it can vector, including anaplasmosis and Lyme disease, or Ehrlichia. Powassan virus encephalitis is a devastating neuroencephalitic disease. There has um, been in my Google feed just in the last couple of weeks where they have declared Babesia as endemic now in New England, which is uh, a disease that is vectored by the deer tick up that way and probably spreading uh, to other places. When we look at where we have the state of it now, and now being 2019, we do see a very similar map to what we saw with the American dog tick. And we are seeing little pinpoints of places where we're finding this tick uh, outside of that host range map. We have really good data about the deer tick because that was the one that was studied um, really extensively by the CDC. And that's the one that we collect a lot of data about in uh, in Ohio. One of the things that really struck me probably only in the last few years as I've been presenting is one of the reasons that ticks are so elite at vectoring disease is because they live for a pretty long time. Ticks live for years. I mean, when we think about different arthropods that we would encounter, mosquitoes or flies or, um, and, and, you know, uh, fleas, different things like that, they don't have a life cycle anywhere near that. When we look at, say, the deer tick, it has a full two-year life cycle. And this might even be longer than that if it has to go into hypobiosis because either the food or the environment is not where it needs to be for them to feed. Um, but that is what really makes it elite at vectoring disease. When we look at seasonality, this is the one that I like to put up because I want to show you this. This is from the Ohio Department of Health. We uh, we encounter ticks in Ohio all 12 months of the year, positive cases of Lyme disease all 12 months of the year. When we look at a seasonality chart, you can see at no point does it go to complete zero for any of the different life stages. And when we look at where we have big worries for things, we have huge spikes coming up shortly in adult deer ticks. And so we're heading out of March, we're heading into April, and we are having our weather go from cold to warmer now. Um, I am thinking we are going to have a lot of people that are going to encounter a lot of deer ticks here really, really soon. And then when we look at the other spikes, we see lots of nymphs where we do have a tremendous amount of that worry for disease transmission, and they spike in late spring and early summer. And then we have an, another huge spike in adult deer ticks when we go into the fall weather. And, and it's it parallels almost deer season. So when we're out hunting deer, deer ticks are out hunting us at the exact same time. And then we look at our maps here. And one of the things that we have is we have a reporting problem uh, in the United States and in Ohio, particularly. When I look at the map of prevalence and every speck that you see of blue is reported cases, we have something like 47 to 50,000 cases reported um, in any given year, and it is increasing every year. The estimates are um, thought to be about a, a tenfold underreported, and we're actually closer to a half a million cases. Uh, and we're starting to see through metadata that that is correct. But when I look at Ohio and I see a razor line between Pennsylvania and Ohio up here, I know that that's more of a reporting problem because it's not like the Ohio PA border is any kind of a 
a barrier for ticks to cross from Pennsylvania over into Ohio. And then when we look at, you know, established counties right here, we see that we have some we have some serious uh, establishment in Ohio. And even though we have no record of deer ticks in there, it wouldn't shock me that we would have um, deer ticks in there because we got plenty of deer. This is a giant cornfield over here. And um, I've driven through this area and I've seen plenty of deer that way. Our real hot spots in Ohio are going to be over here. When we look at the prevalence of, uh, of ticks where we're um, we're doing heavy measurements. We're really seeing Harrison Jefferson. We're seeing a lot in um, Belmont County and a lot in Tuscarawas County. This is Coshocton right here. This was the original county that uh, we had our detection in in Ohio. But this is pretty much anywhere um, we are seeing heavy populations and established colonies of deer ticks. So one of the things that that I really want to um, stress in this talk right now is we really need to make sure that when we are making our personal protective plan that we are uh, engaging our kiddos in the same because kids are by far the most impacted cohorts for Lyme disease by age and sex in Ohio. Take a look at these bars. The most impacted ages are 5 to 9 and 10 to 14. Kiddos are out in the woods. They're rolling around. They might not even be in the woods. They might just be rolling through a public park like a metro park, but they're probably not wearing permethrin treated clothes and they're probably not putting a, applications of topical repellents and they're not doing any kind of tick checks. I mean, heck, when I was a 10 year old boy, I might not shower for three days. And so I would consider myself at risk over there. So we really have to do a better job in terms of our public health outreach to engage, to make sure that we're keeping our kids tick safe as well. And I'm starting to see some interesting metadata about the prevalence rates for the number of people that actually have um, had Lyme disease. And this is a uh, metadata from blood analysis in a study, a huge study involving 150,000 people. In North America, they're thinking we're at about 9.4% of people have had Lyme disease. And in the world, it's up to 14%. That is absolutely huge. That is tremendous. And then this is an interesting uh, study that I saw, because if we think of this as a rural problem and not an urban problem, um, we really need to rethink that. I've gotten lots of phone calls from people, not only in Franklin County, but in, in Cuyahoga County, where Cleveland is, that we have ticks being encountered in urban environments. And in fact, the data plays that out. We do have plenty of ticks in urban environments too. And interestingly, when the weather is warm, we have more Lyme disease claims. And then when it gets cold in rural environments, and then when it gets colder out, we have um, increased in urban environments start to, to um, pick up that way. And, um, and so that is something that we need to make sure that we're addressing as well is, like I said, you, you don't need to be in the woods. Um, you can encounter a tick in about any habitat. And we're also seeing lots of research out there that links invasive plant species. We know barberry is a plant that will provide an optimum habitat for ticks to thrive in. And I'm seeing some research out there that invasive honeysuckle may be doing the same. All right, so let's keep going on our timeline. And now we're up to say 2014 or 15. I don't have an exact date for the Lone Star tick to enter into Ohio, probably crossed over the river from West Virginia. This is a tick that I see as being uh, a, woods, uh, a woods living tick similar to the deer tick. This would be considered a little more aggressive of a feeder than a deer tick. It will feed on multiple species. It will readily feed on people. If I go down to south, uh, southern Ohio, pretty much all the river bend counties down that way, and I do a tick drag, depending on the time of year, I'm likely pulling this tick up more than about any other tick uh, down that way. When we look at our map, one of the things that we see is, and this is an old map, I haven't seen really too, too many 
new um, distribution maps for the host range of these, but we know that they're continuing to expand. I would say that you could probably extend this line so that it would look exactly like the American dog tick or it would look exactly like the black legged tick in terms of its host range here in the eastern half of the United States. And this is one that when I am engaging a new audience and I and I want to make and drive my point home. So generally when I start this presentation for a new audience, I tell them that I'm going to be talking about some scary stuff and I say that my goal is to mildly to moderately terrify, but not completely terrify because I want people to still go out and enjoy nature and do things like that, but I want my point to be remembered. So we try to keep it from going all the way to a 10 and, and maybe keep it closer to about a six on a one to 10 scale for scariness. But when I think of things that would make me sit up and take notice, um, one of the things about the Lone Star Tick is it has been it has been um, linked with a allergic syndrome because there is a chemical component of the saliva of the lone star tick that has similarities to non-primate mammalian muscle. And a person that gets bitten by a lone star tick, if their immune response immune response reacts to that carbohydrate component and develops an immune response to it, you can become allergic to non-primate mammalian muscle, which means you just became allergic to beef, pork, lamb, and venison. And that means you just developed an allergy to a bacon cheeseburger, which is my favorite food of all time. And so one of the reasons I try to keep myself as tick safe as possible is so that I can continue to enjoy bacon cheeseburgers. All right, so now we are only, uh, we are about up to tick number four, and we are probably around 2019, 2020 or so. We had been seeing the Gulf Coast tick migrate its way up from south towards north. This is not an invasive tick. In fact, the Gulf Coast tick has been around for a long, long time. It was one of the very first tick studies identified in the 1800s. This is a tick that I consider to be more of an open habitat tick. This is one that originated in Gulf Coast sort of grasslands down that way. This is one that has shown a lot of adaptability in terms of expansion because it's moved from the Gulf Coast all the way up this way. This is one that if you look at the pictures that I've put up in here, the feeding mouth part, the hypostome on these ticks, the Gulf Coast has just a monster hypostome and it will leave a fairly large wound after feeding and, and that can cause some problems uh, secondary infection wise. It is, um, has its own diseases that it has been associated with in terms of transmission of Rickettsia parkeri to people. That would be sort of a, a little bit milder form of a spotted fever similar to Rocky Mountain spotted fever. It does have some diseases that it vectors to canines. We got a real worry about the vector uh, capability of this tick for leptospirosis because um, lepto would be a, a big worry due to its zoonotic potential. This tick could vector, say, lepto to cattle, and then the cattle could vector the disease to people because it would um, be able to then zoonotically vector that. So this is one that we worry about. We had seen um, we had seen actual detections in Ohio for sporadic ones, but then we had established colonies in around 2020 or so close to Cincinnati, Hamilton, Claremont, Butler kind of corner of the state. When we look at its expansion, and so the original host habitat for that would have been Gulf Coast, and it would have been the yellow that sort of goes from Texas heading up uh, the Atlantic coast a little bit. When you see this expansion into Oklahoma and Arkansas, that was from cattle shipments in the 1970s and 80s. The cattle had Gulf Coast ticks on them. And even though this was not what would be considered their normal host range, they got there, they had food, the habitat was uh, adaptable for them. And so they established. And then we kind of watched them move up the Mississippi and the Ohio River Valleys. And, and then we have them now in Ohio. Uh, and we look for them to expand. So this is me with my mad PowerPoint skills that uh, I drew what looks like a turtle, but this is actually close to where they're modeling this tick would be. Uh, we have had uh, reports of this tick as far up as Maine now, and uh, it may not be going as deep into Appalachia because of the wooded nature of um, the environment here, uh, but we do know we have it up in Ohio now. 
So for the last couple few years, we've been talking about the Asian longhorn tick. Um, this was originally found in terms of a large outbreak in 2017 uh, in New Jersey, and it is one that has since really expanded. And Asian longhorn ticks have a lot of worries. Um, they can vector multiple pathogens, although we don't know really exactly what it can vector. Since it's not from here, we don't know what it will be able to uh, adapt to. We have found that it has certain pathogens in it, but has not necessarily shown the ability to transmit. In its native host range, it can transmit any number of, of very devastating pathogens. It feeds on a tremendous number of hosts, uh, and I will show you a partial list of them, but it is fed on humans. It is fed on companion animals. It's been found on every different species of livestock that we uh, work with here in the United States as well. And then one of the things that is really devastating about this predator is that it has the ability to reproduce via parthenogenesis, which means the female does not need a male in order to mate with and lay eggs. She can spontaneously lay clusters of thousands of eggs she lays them over time, which means they hatch over time. So you might have a host that has multiple different life stages on it at once. The majority of ticks, of Asian longhorn ticks that we have here are female. Males are very, very rare. And, um, and in fact, if the temperatures are right, it can go through its life cycle pretty quickly and um, mature even faster than it would normally mature over time. So we're watching the spread of this one. And in Ohio, the last time I spoke to you, we probably only had it in maybe two counties. Maybe I was just starting to talk about county number three, but going from its pathway here, we had first found it in Ohio in Gallia County down in Southern Ohio. And that was initially found on a rescue dog that had come into a humane organization. And when they did their examination, they found ticks on it, which they then shipped up to Ohio State where a colleague of Amy and mine, her name's Risa Pesapane. She's a dynamite researcher. She made a positive identification of the Asian longhorn tick, and that was our first one. And since it's an invasive, and especially with parthenogenic reproduction, when you find one, you assume it's there. So the next spring, um, I mentioned to Risa that we have a uh, next door county, Jackson County, that has an agricultural research farm on there, and they're going to be working cattle. And that might be a great opportunity for um, them, the, her students to go there and sample and see if they would find ticks on them. And they did. They pulled one tick off in Jackson, and that was in the spring. And then what we had happen after that, just a month or two later, we had a devastating outbreak of ticks uh, in large numbers on cattle in July of probably 2021 and that was in Monroe County right over here on the river and that tick uh, outbreak with huge numbers of ticks on cattle actually did result in fatality and we knew that this tick had the ability to do that because it can breed in such tremendous numbers it can overwhelm uh, its host and, and they will do uh, counts of ticks off deer and find ticks in the thousands on those animals. And so then last year, we had uh, two more outbreaks of large numbers of ticks on cattle. And again, both of those were in July. And that was over here in Morgan and Belmont County. And they um, the producers working with their vets were able to discover the ticks in large number and apply caricides and um, and do some, some uh, veterinary medical intervention and they avoided fatality in those cases. Later in the year, we had uh, a sample that had been turned in um, previously from Guernsey County. That was a tick that was pulled off of a gray fox. And so that was county number six. And then county number seven is my county right here, Franklin County, which is an urban county. We um, we are the largest county by population in Ohio. We have City of Columbus, the 14th largest state in the United States, and there was an Asian longhorn tick found uh, on a human in Franklin County, and that brought us up to number seven. And so, you know, when we look at the, the various things that we have going on with the Asian longhorn tick, we have it in Ohio. We probably have it in more counties than that. So this is the up-to-date map uh, distribution map with county and state listed as um, as of the last Asian longhorn tick sit rep, which was February 27th. We uh, see that from Jersey, it has spread 
probably on live or sorry, probably on wild animal or on avian hosts. We do have some outliers that we can see, and that could be from avian migration. That could also be from livestock shipments. Um, but we're going to continue to monitor this, and uh, we have a monthly call that I participate in when time allows to get updates on where we're having uh, outbreaks of ticks. The most recent state that we added since I talked to you uh, last would have been Massachusetts, and that became state number 18. So when we talk about serious worries for this tick, one of the things that really, really makes me worried is because of its parthenogenic nature, this tick needs one female to establish a colony wherever she can find a spot and has food and the habitat is amenable to her doing so. And we have found this tick now on 11 avian species, roughly half of them are migratory waterfowl. So this tick has a means of transportation um, and it can land in places and it can establish colonies. And so one of the questions that I think about when I think about this tick is why do we in some cases have just explosive growth of ticks and in other cases we'll find just one. So in 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 Monroe County, Belmont County and in Morgan County, we had huge numbers of ticks on cattle. But when we look at Jackson County, we only had that one tick. And when we evaluated the initial outbreak in New Jersey in 2017, we just had a huge number of ticks in that farm. But when they revisited samples that had been submitted in 2010 from a white-tailed deer and from a dog in 2013, we found that it had gotten here in the past. It just had not established a colony. And what we're finding is it really is sort of a habitat uh, thing. This tick does have a certain preferential habitat and and what we're finding is when the habitat is right, it can breed into tremendous numbers. So when we had the initial huge outbreak with livestock mortality in Monroe County, um, a team from OSU went there and they went there in Tyvek uh, with the seams taped in order to do a tick drag and see what kind of tick numbers we have there and then test them for pathogens and, and see if we could figure out a cause for the livestock mortality. They walked in the gate of the farm and they did their first tick drag when they walked in there and then and they rolled the lint hair roller on that one square meter of cloth. And this is what they pulled out. And every dot on this roller is an Asian longhorn tick. You've got two adults and the rest of these are all nymphs. And in that pasture, there was estimated to be millions of ticks. And so when the animals were rotated into that pasture, and the pasture was hyper mature. This is pasture that was probably eye high grass. The producer had not grazed it for a full year. They were moving animals in there for the animals to kind of clean up whatever forage that they might find in that pasture that's usable before they bush hogged it. But those animals went into an absolute infestation and they were uh, covered with hungry ticks that were um, that were blood feeding. And so the working diagnosis is that the mortality was from blood loss anemia and secondary um, shock to that. Now, when we are evaluating sort of when we have spikes, so I showed you the, the life cycle spikes for the black-legged tick earlier on, and this is not Ohio data. There's a lot of great research coming out of Rutgers and um, some researchers on the East Coast that are evaluating like what products are efficacious to apply to cattle or what products are efficacious in the environment that are gonna work as a caricides. What they have done is they have plotted where they see their spikes in the various life cycles up there. And and we would probably have similar spikes here in Ohio. Uh, we are collecting data on prevalence now. They are ahead of the game over there on the East Coast. But what we found in Ohio that all three places where we had huge number outbreaks of ticks occurred when we had optimal habitat for the ticks. They like lots of heat. They need a humid spot in order to continue their maturation after blood feeding because they don't spend a tremendous amount of time on the host. And so in all three cases, this is where cattle had been rotated either into tall grass or that last paddock where the grass was a little bit more lush. In each of the last few years, we've had decent rainfall that has allowed good grass growth even into warmer months where a lot of the times with the cool season um, perennials that we graze here in Ohio, if we get a lot of heat before that, those pastures might be dormant. But in the last couple of years, we have had some ideal 
uh, environmental conditions for ticks on pasture to breed in large numbers when it's super hot outside and when the grass is a little bit long so that those ticks can find the humidity level that they need and they do need a uh, relatively high relative humidity in order to breed in large numbers. So we need to do a little bit more work on this, but when I go around and engage cattle producers and they ask, what should we do? I tell them, I mean, here's your worry times and here's your worry situations. And you wanna make sure that you have uh, increased your scouting for ticks. You wanna think about even doing tick drags to make sure that you uh, know what your burden is when you rotate into a pasture in the danger zones. And and you want to have any acaricides ready to go to apply to animals. If not, have them already applied before you would go in during the risky time. And then I talk to the producers about keeping themselves safe because, you know, these ticks will feed on people. Although we have found that we are not their preferential host, quite honestly. They like animals um, better than people. But if you walk into a habitat with millions of ticks in a pasture, you're going to have those ticks on you. And if you go in with your machinery to work that pasture, you're going to have ticks all over that machinery and you have the potential to spread them to other places as well. So now we are starting to collect data, and this is from the uh, USDA National Cattle Tick Zoom uh, monthly update, but it is showing what we're finding to try to figure out what can the Asian longhorn tick competently vector, and what we have found that right now we know it can competently vector thyleria, which is a protozoal parasite that affects cattle, uh, causes thyloritis, which is kind of similar to in presentation to anaplasmosis uh, and a little bit kind of like what the appearance of malaria would be in people. What we have found when they do field collected ticks, uh, Asian longhorn ticks, that they are finding thyleria and then they are finding Lyme disease, or really a Borgdorferi uh, sensu strictu inside the ticks, anaplasma phagocytophilum, which is the human variant and bourbon virus. Although we are not matching that to transmission data uh, in the field, except right now for thyleria. And then in the laboratory, it has been found that it can vector Rocky Mountain spotted fever, thyleria, Heartland and Powassan virus, but not be able to transmit um, Lyme disease, anaplasma, phagocytophilum, or tularemia. And so research is ongoing so that we know um, what we have worries about. One of the things that I found when I was doing a lit review uh, a little while ago to prepare for um, these presentations was we don't have confirmation that this tick would be able to induce the alpha-gal mammalian muscle allergy that we do know is linked to lone star ticks, but there is some research that shows uh, in Japan where this tick is endemic that they have increased numbers of people that are uh, testing positive for alpha-gal um, mammalian muscle allergy in Japan in the uh, areas where they have very high levels of Asian longhorn tick. And so that would be another worry for us. And so there's tick maps that model where the ticks are at and, and where we need to watch for them. And when we look at this model, um, we see that the light tan is where one model agrees and the butterscotch is two models. And then bright red is where all three models agree. Um, but one of the things that, that I have a worry about and, and really shows that ticks don't really read the literature is um, the majority of our positives in Ohio are in counties that only two of the three uh, research studies agree that this tick would be able to um, live at. We know it doesn't like cold weather and it it doesn't like, it, you know, it, it it likes, when I say cold weather, I mean the kind of cold that my wife doesn't like that I don't mind at all. It will uh, start to decrease its activity when it gets close to the low 50s and into the 40s where a bunch of the other ticks in Ohio will do just fine at that level. So we have one publication out, which is Asian Longhorn Ticks in Ohio, and that would be a very useful fact sheet to share to your clients if you should need to do so. You can find that on Ohio Line. I am working um, on a fact sheet that I hope to have out later this year that is managing Asian Lane. Asian longhorn ticks on pasture to try to get that out before our summer weather in anticipation that we might have some more large scale outbreaks of tick on pasture. So when I get to this point and I have um, mildly to moderately terrified the audience, I do like to kind of bring it down a little bit and talk about how you can keep yourself and your family and your animals tick safe. And that starts with 
if you get a tick on you, you need to know the correct removal for a tick. And when I was in private practice, I saw every way. And there are studies that associate improper removal techniques with a higher potential transmission of disease. Because if you just grab it by its butt and you try to yank it off, you're probably going to uh, expel its gut contents into you and then rip the abdomen off and leave the head embedded. So you want to get all the way to the head with pointy tweezers or a tick tool. And with firm, straight up pressure, you want to get that tick with the head and all removed and then save that tick wash your hands, wash that spot. A great place to save a tick if you want to get it submitted for identification or for uh, detection of disease present in it would be in a Ziploc bag with a little bit of hand sanitizer. When we talk about our environment, I get a lot of calls about um, you know, spraying my backyard or something for ticks. And because ticks are so mobile on a host, um, while you can get some control in the short term, you don't get control in the long term. And studies have shown that even if you treat an environment and you decrease the ticks in there, you don't necessarily decrease the risk of tick vector disease. When we study a tick, we know that 90% of the time it exists off the host and where it spends most of its time is really in the edge habitat around a, say, if we're talking about an average backyard. It's only a small percentage of them is going to be in the middle of the sunny grass because especially if that grass is mowed, that is going to be um, a pretty dry environment. But when we look at, say, a yard, especially a yard that might go up against a woodland, and we were evaluating really how we can keep ourselves tick safe and keep our kids tick safe in this environment. You know, if you have an edge habitat here, and this is going to be where you're going to have, you know, uh, optimal habitat for ticks to exist. If, say, you have your swing set, you wouldn't want to stick that all the way up against the woods, um, like where my swing set was when I was a kid, because that would put it right into tick habitat, similar to, um, you like your vegetable garden or something like that, you know, you're going to have deer that are going to migrate over there and they're going to eat whatever the groundhogs haven't eaten already. But having it moved away from uh, the woods is going to be helpful. Plus, you'll get more sunlight and probably grow more veggies that way. And then they talk about doing things like making sure you don't have brush piles or leaf piles and even having a border of, say, a mulch or gravel um, in it, between the that edge habitat and your yard is helpful at decreasing tick numbers. And basically, you want to stay a roughly three yards, around 10 feet or so from the, the higher levels of potential uh, tick encounter. Then what we talk about is part of our personal protective plan. You want to make a, a plan so you can keep yourself safe. First step on that is permethrin treated clothing. You can purchase it from any number of outfitters. There um, are ways that you can self-treat. If you're going to use permethrin to self-treat your clothes, your pants, long pants I like, light colors, long sleeves, light colors, or you're going to treat your shoes or hiking boots, you want to use a permethrin product that is labeled for use on fabric. Make sure that you read, understand, and follow the label on any pesticide products that you use. Remember, the label is federal law. And then you want to add a topical repellent to that. So permethrin goes on the clothing. Repellents go on your skin. And I tell folks, be a label reader. There are several choices that are out there. There's no one perfect choice that I would say this is the one you use in every situation because we have different situations and we have different audiences. It might be kids. There might be swimming involved. There's different times that they're labeled for. And quite honestly, the different concentrations may or may not even be labeled for ticks. And so make sure that you do a good job educating yourself on what the variants, various repellents do and do not do and read, understand, and follow that label so that you can apply it safely and correctly. And so the take homes for that are make sure that you understand that really tick diseases are prevention diseases. I truly want everyone here to never get bit by a tick for the entire rest of their lives. And then understand our myths. We can find ticks outside in any habitat and any month of the year. Realize that we are seeing new things come out. We got we have new research coming out. We're constantly learning more. Um, we will do our very best job in extension at getting that out to all of our county client residents. Realize that 
we are seeing ticks as vectors of bacterial, viral, and protozoal pathogens. Plus, they could potentially induce an allergic syndrome if your immune system reacts negatively to a tick bite. And so you want to make your personal plan for safety, and that is your permethrin-treated clothing. That is your repellents. That is a really good um, post outside tick check that might be throwing the clothes in the dryer for 20 minutes in order to make sure if any stragglers hitched a ride in there, you take care of them. Make sure that you include your four-legged friends, um, our puppy dogs and our kitty cats uh, are not really good at actually doing tick checks, um, but they are tick magnets when they are outside. So know that your companion animals can break your biosecurity protocols. Work with your veterinarian to make sure that you are using the best product that fits in your budget budget and fits in the situation of your animal and your lifestyle. Familiarize yourself with the proper removal method for ticks and then you can submit that tick for identification to your public health organization or if you have worries that it has a pathogen in it, uh, you can submit that tick for pathogen testing to make sure that it does not have a pathogen because if it doesn't have one in you, it can't vector that to you. And then honestly, one of the biggest components of your um, integrated pest management protocol is awareness. Make sure that you have proper awareness when you are outside in a potential tick habitat. I still go outside and go in hikes and go to metro parks and do things like that. I wear the protective clothing. I try to stay in the middle of the path. I'm not going to wander off necessarily into the brush anymore because that's where the ticks are going to be attached to vegetation and questing. I've uh, adapted a little bit in how I make sure that I keep myself safe because like I said, it is different now. It is so much different than when I was a kid. It is different than even the way it was 10 years ago in Ohio. That is the speed uh, that we have uh, tried to adapt in terms of how fast the world of ticks and tick vector disease around us is moving. So that's all the slides that I got. And um, I am perfectly delighted to take uh, questions if we have any questions. If you want to dump those into the q and I'll start plugging through them and Robin can... Um, they can start cleaning them up. So Kathleen says, aren't there a lot of deer ticks in Ashtabula County? Kathleen, I would say for sure, Ashtabula County is right up on the border with Pennsylvania. And when we looked at the prevalence maps that I showed you about midway through the presentation, we know that on the PA side of the border, we have large numbers of ticks. And that would tell me that in Ashtabula County, we would have large numbers of ticks as well. You could contact Ashtabula County Public Health um, and find out if they are keeping prevalence data for your county up that way, and that might give you a little bit more uh, information. And then Peggy asks, um, how do you do a tick drag? Okay, so a tick drag is where you take a roughly one square yard of cloth and you use kind of a grabby cloth. You you wouldn't use something that would be really um, smooth. I like to use, you know, corduroy or felt. Those make really good ones. And then you lay that down over a, a, a habitat. You could, you could kind of move it through a bush. You could lay it down on the grass if you were checking out a pasture. And then you pull that up. And the best way is that I found is that lint hair roller where you roll it over the fabric and then the ticks stick to that and then you can undo that and you can count if you got lucky and how many ticks you might have found on there. And then since you have um, got a, a, a unit of measurement that can allow you to extrapolate the amount of ticks that you would have in a given, uh, in a given area. All right. And Sarah asks, can Asian longhorn ticks lay eggs on a host itself? And if so, can they hatch on that host and begin feeding? So um, I don't believe Asian longhorn ticks live on the host all time. They're going to they're going to do blood feeding and they're going to fall out into the environment and they're going to mature under wherever organic matter that they would find to do that. Although there is a tick that the uh, will persist and go through its entire life cycle on the host. That is the brown brown dog tick. And I used to have the brown dog tick in this presentation. It has not been linked to uh, big time disease transmission in Ohio. And so it's not really considered a tick of medical importance, but I will say that it has been associated with outbreaks of Rocky Mountain spotted fever in other places. So that is something that we want to um, keep track of. And Donna asked, do you have a PowerPoint presentation we can use for the public? So Donna, 
what we're going to do with this presentation is it is being recorded and then it will be hosted on YouTube and then you will be able to share the YouTube link. Um, I'm not I'm not really able to send uh, OSU branded slides out for that, but depending on where you are. What I tell folks is whether you're in Ohio or you're in Michigan and or you're in Indiana, the land grant universities for all of those are Ohio State, Michigan State and Purdue. And um, if you want to have a presentation on tick safety in your county, co contact your county educator in Ohio. You can find that at either extension.osu.edu or you can go to the county website and we do our websites by county name .osu.edu. So I'm in Franklin County, which is franklin.osu.edu. Contact your educator and say that you would like to have a tick presentation in your county. I um, have provided this presentation to all of my Ag and Natural Resources colleagues so that they can use it, modify it, and deliver it to whatever audience that they want to do. We use it for pesticide applicator training. We, um, we do this for master gardeners. We do this for naturalists, anything like that. And they can can request you can request a presentation from them and if you are in a different uh, state and you would like to have uh, a presentation done ask your county educator contact me I would be delighted to work with extension professionals not just in Ohio but in other states uh, to assist them in developing presentation materials to assist their county client residents all right and drew says do you know if the allergy associated with alpha gal syndrome fades over time and so drew they are finding that it does fade slowly over time, but the rate is variable and it's dependent on the person. And they are finding, and I was just reading about this today, that you can get re-exposure um, from other Lone Star tick bites, which will keep the allergy at a high level if you get bit again. So if you did have alpha-gal, you would double down on your, um, on your, you know, uh, your attempts to stay uh, away from Lone Star ticks. And they don't really know uh, if there is an exact time, but they are seeing the um, the effects of alpha gal decrease over time in certain people, and that decrease is individual and variable to the person. And Dennis asks, "Are you aware of any correlation between diseases and our bio labs?" Um, I don't know of any correlation between diseases and bio labs. Um, no, I, I haven't seen any research or, or any literature on that. And so, Brielle, your question is pretty similar to uh, what um, what was asked earlier. And so if that is, uh, if you have additional questions about that, just go ahead and redrop uh, more specific uh, bullet points in the Q&A, and I will try to get to that. All right, standing in a parking lot near Floyd County Extension on a very window day, a tick landed on my hand, writing itself. It got busy finding a feeding spot. Yikes. Um, well, the good news is you found it before it started to feed. Um, and so good job with your uh, in the field tick check. And then Mark asks, are birds responsible for moving ticks farther distances than other animals? Um, they have the potential to do so because of flight. Um, but any different, any livestock uh, is able, or I keep saying livestock, sorry. Any animal is capable of moving ticks on it in whatever their, um, wherever their range would be that they would live in. So I would say birds, yes, simply because they're going to fly. Um, but I would say, you know, deer can move ticks pretty far as well. All right, so Linda asks, you mentioned a caricide used for high infestation on the cattle. Is that treatment directly to the animals or to the environment? So there's actually two different ways that that, that would be applied. So you could do an acaricide that would be a, applied to the animal, and that would be a could be a permethrin product, although there's a couple few products in there, and that is labeled for use on cattle for ticks and that could be a pour on that could be um you know an ear tag there could be any number of different things that way but it would be labeled for use on ticks and then when we talk about applications in the environment those are those are similar chemical formulations but totally different 
you know, in terms of their way that they're formulated for application and they would have to be stated for label use. And there are certain products that are out there that are labeled for use on, on grass, on, you know, on for pastures and rangelands and things like that. The ones that are applied on cattle go on cattle. The ones that are applied to say a pasture, like when we had the um, high levels of ticks infesting the pastures that I mentioned, those have to contact the tick directly and so that was where we had a um we had some big problems because it was really tall grass and so if we were to apply a um a pasture application of a of a product to kill ticks if it went on the top of the grass and the ticks were down at the bottom it's not going to get on the ticks and if we brush hog that pasture we're going to have a dense residue mat that the ticks would hide under and so that is one of the limitations of products that we would apply in the environment is they do have to touch the tick in order to work and then Sarah asked, do you believe the correlation between honeysuckle barberry and ticks is specific to an interaction between those plants and the ticks, or is it a matter, matter of suitable brush habitat? I think that it's probably more um, a suitable brush habitat. They are, um, they're very dense and they can provide kind of a, a little individual micro environment of, of suitable habitat within those stands. And then Ellen asks, are the ticks on chickens as a bird that can move as livestock? So you can have, um, so the most common ticks that we would have on chickens would actually not be the hard shelled Ixodes ticks that, that I mentioned is medically important. They will have uh, soft bodied Argus ticks, but um, the Asian longhorn tick has been found feeding on chickens and has actually been uh, implicated in causing a fatality on a chicken. And um, but I will say that I've had anecdotal uh, anecdotal sort of stories from clients as I go around and speak that they have taught told me that in places where their poultry forage, they have had less ticks in, in that environment because the birds will eat them. So John asked a great question that I probably should have talked about. Have any tick populations begun to show resistance to chemical controls? I have not seen that here reported in the United States, but overseas we have seen resistance to different products like ivermectin or some other pyrethroids. And it's anticipated that uh, if we start increasing use like anything, we're going to start getting resistance. Where I have tremendous worries with the Asian longhorn tick and pesticide resistance developing over time is that due to its parthenogenic reproduction, if mama becomes resistant and she passes her genetics on to her genetic clones, then all her babies are resistant. And since she doesn't mate with males, there is no refugia in the environment of a susceptible um, male that then could introduce susceptible genetics back into it. So I think that in the Asian longhorn tick, resistance to uh, acaricides would spread pretty quick. And so any research on antibiotics? Um, I'm, I'm assuming so. I am not on the human medical side, so I, I don't have anything to share that way. Uh, we, you know, we we don't develop necessarily any of the products. And I'm going to lump antibiotics in with with pesticides and herbicides. Uh, we are not really matching the speed of our development with the um, development of new products to match the speed of development of resistance issues. So. Una asks, I've read that permethrins are lethal for cats. True. And yes, they are. Um, permethrin products are neurotoxic to our kitty cat friends. And so if you were to apply a permethrin product to your clothing, um, I have cats and here's what I did with mine is my cats are indoors and I took my, um, my boots and my pants out to the garage and I hung the pants up with those, that hanger that has the two clips on it. And then I sprayed the, um, the pants with permethrin according to the label and I let it dry completely so that there would be no chance for my cat to come into contact with that. And then Drew asks, can you speak to the effects of chemical control of ticks in the landscape on native author populations? Uh, any chemicals specifically rated for tick control? So Drew, yes, if you used bifenthrin or lambda cyhalothrin in the environment, which are very effective for tick control in the environment, you are going to pretty much kill every last thing that would be in that environment. Um, and then are any chemicals specifically rated for tick control? There was a, um, there is 
a product, and, and I don't know if they're if it's released yet or they're studying it, there's a metarrhizal fungus that um, that they were working on that is specific to ticks and actually was sparing to um, to pollinators that was uh, under investigating under investigation for use in the environment. And some of the initial stuff that I saw on it was very favorable and it actually had a control percentage similar to a pyrethroid. And then Janet asks, are possums ecological tick traps? So there was an article many years ago that um, that showed that possums were tick vacuums and they ate tons and tons of ticks. And when the study was reevaluated, they found that it was flawed and that um, actually possums are not. Uh, they will occasionally eat ticks, but they would rather probably eat an earthworm. And so they are not the solution to our prayers. Before I saw that study um, revisions and, and further exploration on it, I used to tell people, you know, you want to clear them out of the yard, just get yourself a big box of possums and sprinkle them all in there. But one of the things that I have not seen, and I get questions about it all the time from people is, you know, when you have an outbreak of a, basically a food product, if we'll call ticks a food product, why do we not have a subsequent out uh, increase in the population of something that preferentially eats that for food? And we have not seen that so far with ticks. And um, the hope would be that there would be something that would take advantage of the explosion in population of, of ticks that we have. Um, but I haven't seen anything for that yet. Wow, looks like you've... Oh, here we have another one. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll slip one in there before we let everybody head to lunch. Uh, so ticks have biocontrol agents, insects or disease that kill them. Um, yes, likely they do. But to kind of go back to the last two, um, the last two questions regarding that, we, we have not seen to where we have a you know, where we have a subsequent increase of those yet that is knocking that population back. And that, um, that, that fungus that I referenced would be one of the biological control agents that's being developed for tick control. Well, as usual, Tim, you have given us a great insight on what's going on with the ticks and uh, in North America. Not particular. it's a little scary, but we will forge on and try to figure out how to keep ourselves safe. Um, thanks again so much for um, being part of you know, P, the EAB University because we always learn so much from you, Tim. And thanks everyone for your interest. You will be getting an email tomorrow in case you find you have another question you'd like or comment you'd like to share with Tim. You will have his um, email address and you can um, go from there. And again, this is being recorded and will be available on the emerald-bore.info website. So I'm glad everyone was able to come and I hope you learned as much as I did. Thanks, and I'm gonna close our webinar for today. <laughs>